and who we have with us i guess andre right yeah all right another great concept or aspect hi andre how are you hi everyone hey yeah it's so nice yeah. to see you with us nice to see you guys too all right so right now we have andre and mm -hmm. he's the formal verification engineer straight from runtime verification and yep. it's still we can say a uh, less explored area right in terms of security uh, because we go ahead with audits and we still often miss out uh, formal verification which is still a critical component and can this uh, like provide us some uh, many un like undiscovered bugs that probably uh, would not be possible with some manual testing and all so with that entry thank you so much for joining us and with that the stage is all yours i know that you have a lot of things to share and we all are excited for you all right thank you so i'm just going to share my screen uh, right now all right uh, just let me know if you guys can see the screen yes it's visible completely fine yeah. great so um Hi everyone, I'm Andre Vaccaro. I'm a, a key developer mostly at Runtime Verification Incorporated. And today I will talk about formally verifying uh, smart contracts. And um, I'll be using KVM, which is a key implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine. It's fully faithful with other implementations and uh, it's also a key formal semantics. Uh, what uh, meaning that we can use it to do formal verification on Ethereum uh, programs. So, as an overview, I'm gonna uh, go and explain what K framework is, um, what formal verification and symbolic execution is, uh, and then I'm gonna show you what is our approach to formal verification and have a short um, demo session. So uh, real quick, Runtime, Verif Runtime Verification Incorporated is a um, formal methods company. We have serviced before uh, clients in automotive and uh, aeronautics uh, companies. Uh, now we're mostly focused on um, blockchain clients and the general mission is to improve the, basically the state of security and the quality and the correctness of the code across the board. So, all right, <clears throat> what's K? So K is a mathematical modeling language. So basically you build mathematical models in K. Uh, one of the key features is that um, those modules are actually executable. So for example, you can take a test suit and execute it against uh, the K Ethereum virtual machine, the KVM, um, which is actually the mathematical model of the Ethereum virtual machine in K. And this also allows you to uh, make proofs on it. So uh, K has uh, uh, two backends, which are currently in use. The LLVM backend, which is mostly for concrete execution. So it gives you a fast interpreter. And the Haskell backend, which is for symbolic execution. Um, okay. So... For example, uh, if you were to say to wanting to make a new programming language, you could choose to write it either in C um, or in K, let's say. So if you choose to write it in C, then what you would get is a very fast um, execution, a very fast interpreter. Um, but if you choose to write it in K instead, uh, you still get execution, which is not as fast as if it was in, written in C. Uh, but you would also get symbolic execution, which gives you the ability to write proofs. So um, that's the reason you would choose to implement it in K. Um, also, um, the advantage, advantages are that uh, you would develop um, a semantics for a programming language or that mathematical module, and um, you would save the implementation effort for uh, multiple tools which K provides you. Um, also, for example, if you have multiple model multiple models in um, implemented, then upgrading one tool, like for example, upgrading the compiler 
would benefit all the other models which you have implemented in K. Mm, okay. Now, formal verification. Um, it's a pretty broad uh, term, which means different things for different people. Um, basically, uh, formal verification is the process of checking that a uh, design satisfies its system requirements. Uh, in other words, to check if the code behaves as expected using some formalism. So testing is a very good way to show the presence of bugs, uh, but it can't show the absence of bugs. Um, so as a scenario, you would write some tests, you would find some bugs, you would fix that bugs, uh, but you have no guarantee that there are no other bugs in your contract. Um, so to prove that there are no bugs, you have to do this mathematically, uh, like a mathematical proof, which you do on a pen and paper, but this time we have computers, um, which help us very much because the proofs can get pretty big. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. Uh, so what do you need? You need the mathematical model of the programming language. Uh, as I said, we have the KEVM. Uh, the next step would be to have a specification of your program written in the same language. So basically a specification is uh, initially written in a very informal way, like an auditor has a chat with the, um, or sits at the table and discuss, discuss with the code developers and they agree on what's the behavior of the code and what it shall do. Um, so as I said, it's a manual process and it's informal. So the next step, it would be to take that specification and uh, translate it into K. Uh, and since both the specification and the uh, semantics of the virtual machine are both written in K, uh, they would work very good together. And uh, we would actually use the prover to see if the proof, if the specification passes. Um, so it's key to know what this gives you and what it doesn't give you. Uh, so people think like if the program is formally verified, then it's 100% safe. And this is not the case. Uh, when you're doing formal verification, you're um, you're verifying that a specific or a very exact specification of uh, your contract is true. Uh, the same like you're doing testing, for example, you have a test which passes, that's very good, it means that scenario is working, but you have no guarantee about other scenarios. Uh, so like in testing, you have to think about all the corner cases and all the things you uh, want to prove. Hmm, okay. Um, so, yeah, as an example, uh, if we, if you would have a proof on a transfer form function for, for an ERC-20 contract, then this wouldn't give you any guarantee for an approved function or, or any other function of the token. Um, okay. So, yeah. I'd like to talk a bit about symbolic execution um, and I'm gonna go a bit, a bit back and forth with uh, testing. So as I said, with testing, you're picking specific scenarios and you're just doing sanity checks for it. So let's say we have a contract and this contract is in an initial state as zero and <clears throat> it would have a function like deposit to deposit some tokens or I don't know, some value. And this function would have uh, only a single argument. Um, okay. And in a test, you would uh, write a test using a, symbol, a concrete value like three. And this would have a very clear and specific execution path uh, from start to finish. But uh, in reality, um, all the, most of the functions have also branching points like if statements require clauses, assertion clauses, and so on. So each branching point makes a different execution path. Um, so you would have to take all the cases in consideration. 
So what symbolic execution does is it takes a symbolic value on X in this case, like an identifier. And <clears throat> instead of going and iterating through all the values of the um, argument type. So for example, if in EVM, we would have an EVM word, which would be a value somewhere between zero and two to the power of 256. So instead of iterating through all of that values, we would have a single X value, a uh, symbolic one. And um, we would go through the execution process and we would do some kind of analy analytical reasoning. Um, so what you get is this entire space of execution path that encompass all the cases that X could take. And as I said, instead of looking at um, each execution path, we would do it uh, in a closed form and analytical way. So in the end, we would get a single state description, uh, but that state contains the symbolic, va symbolic value and it would represent a bunch of states. Um, yeah, so, and again, holding a symbolic value would give, um, would be a lot less uh, resource intensive because um, you wouldn't have to go, as I said, through all the possible values which uh, an argument might take. Um, yeah, so again, testing can prove the presence of a bug, but uh, because you have the specific execution trace that shows you the presence of the bug, it can prove the absence of bugs because you're not checking any values there. Uh, so we're doing formal verification to get the entire diagram here. Uh, but you have to remember that formal verification, it's not a magic bullet. It's not like you're doing it once and your contract secure. It will give you a high confidence only for the properties and symbolic tests, which you have written. Um, okay. So. As I said before, um, we are using the KEVM, uh, which is the K implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, here we have the um, repository. Um, it would take some while to set up. So if you want to follow along, I um, suggest that you wait for this presentation to finish and then you will have all the slides and this video and you could follow along and uh, do it yourself. And so, as I said, is the full implementation of EVM. We tested it against the same test suit that other clients like Geth um, tested. Um, similar for Ethereum CPP and Ethereum JSVM, we use the same test suit for all the Ethereum tests. Um, so we know that we have a faithful implementation of the EVM in our mathematical modeling language. So yeah, we also have release instructions. Uh, uh, we have uh, instructions if you want to build it from source. Uh, basically, you would have to clone the repository, uh, fetching, fetch all the submodules dependencies. Uh, then you would have to run some make commands. Um, but also very important is that if you choose to install it, um, please be sure to have all the system dependencies pre-installed before or to install it for install them first because without them you wouldn't be able to run the make comments um okay so uh let's look um over a specification as i said uh first i'm going to show the solidity code which is some kind of erc20 token but it's not correct it has some bugs in it uh, so don't trust it and don't use it for any one of your projects. Uh, but yeah, you can see it has uh, balances, allowances, it has the total supply, decimals, uh, a name and a symbol. It has a constructor to um, initiate all those values. We have some getters and uh, some of the ERC20 functions like transfer, allowance, approve, and transfer from. Um, Okay, so basically this is the contract. The next step would be to 
uh, the next step would be to have a specification. As I said, we need to know what the contract should do. So for this example, we would look at a few functions. So the decimal and the total supply functions should return the correct storage slot and they shouldn't do anything else to the state of the program. So they shouldn't, they are not supposed to change anything in the program, just returning the correct value. Um, okay, and then we have the approve function, which um, should update the correct storage slot, should do nothing else. And uh, if we look at the code, the approve function uh, has two requirements. So if either the owner of or the spender is the zero address, then it should revert and shouldn't um, continue executing. Um, in the other case in which uh, the owner and the spender are not the zero address, then uh, the allowance of the owner for a specific spender should be updated to a specific amount. So basically this is what the approve function does. Um, all right. So this is our specification. The next step would be to write the formal specification, the one in K. So here I'm just having uh, some snippets of it, which um, I'm going to show you right now. Um, so this is how a K configuration looks like, uh, which is uh, representing the state of the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, and it's made of, out of um, what we call cells. So for example, we have a call data cell and the status code cell and so on. So here you can see that we're calling the decimals function. And uh, in the K cell, you can see that we want to uh, execute the entire program from start to finish. Um, we want um, that all of the ex executions in all the cases, we want the status code to be a success. So we are not looking for reverts. We're expecting to program to succeed in um, all cases. Okay. And we also want the function to return in all the cases, the um, decimals value, uh, which is a symbolic value. Um, and we can see here in the uh, requirements down below that the decimals uh, come from the account storage. So here we have the account, which is the contract, and uh, we are doing a lookup inside its uh, storage, looking at the decimals key, and we are uh, taking that value and returning it. Um, also here in the first part of the operation, we are doing a bitwise operation because in the contract, in our contract, the decimals value is a uint 8. So we're doing this um, a bitwise operation just to um, take that specific 8 bytes. Um, okay. Uh, so that would be how a specification would be written. Um, it, there should be other fields. Uh, for example, the specification also requires the program, the bytecode of the contract. So that would mean that you would have first to you would first have to compile the bytecode um, with the Solidity compiler. Um, let me do it here. For some reason, it moves pretty slow, so. So this is the same contract and I'm gonna use SolC to compile it. So this would actually be the bytecode of the contract, the binary part, which is also the compilation of the Solidity. So from Solidity, which is a higher level language, 
go to the bytecode, which is the input of the Ethereum virtual machine. So um, each byte represents an opcode and it's executed by the machine. So yeah, basically the next step would be to take this bytecode and put it into the specification, which I showed you snippets of, and then you would have to run the, run the proof. So uh, I already introduced the uh, bytecode for the purpose of this presentation, and I'm just gonna um, uh, run the prover. So I'm just gonna Um, one second. Okay, so uh, while the prover is working, uh, it should take a while, a few minutes, because it's, um, oh, actually, I'm going to stop it now because I skipped a step. So, yeah, here is the specification and um, how does it actually look like. Um, one other advantage of the K framework is that uh, you can write it in Markdown and the code snippets which are actually executable are inside the k uh, annotation tag so basically you can store your code and add documentation it can be uh, pretty easy from this point of view so yeah uh, most of this part is boilerplate uh, like there are some things required but um, here is our claim which was <clears throat> also in the slide um, so the first part of the cells are as i said boilerplate we don't actually we're not gonna look into them uh, but they are still required because without them uh, the prover would complain mm, all right so uh, since i have multiple claims here i'm just gonna um, comment the ones uh, comment out the ones which I'm not talking about and I'm gonna keep only the claim for the um, decimals function okay so now I can execute it sorry for that um, yeah so this is as I said the decimal function uh, for the total supply it should be pretty similar because it's also a getter. So basically you would just copy paste the decimals function um, as a starting point. You would have to adjust the call data cell to call the total supply function instead. And you would have to adjust the storage slot lookup in the requires clauses. Uh, so for example here, this is the claim for the total supply. And you can see that we are now calling total supply instead. Uh, we're also returning the total supply value. We are still expecting uh, success in um, each execution. And we're getting the total supply value from the storage. Uh, and we're going to look at the total supply uh, position. So this value is actually, I think I'm going to go back to the Solidity code and explain. So when a contract is compiled and is stored in the storage, each of its fields is going to be at some kind of index. So for example, and there will be counted from zero. So for example, balances would, balances would be zero, allowances would be one, total supply would be two, and decimals would be three, and so on. So basically, this is just uh, sugaring um, the value. OK. Mm, and as I said, um, another interest, another key feature uh, in the claim is that <clears throat> uh, the storage, the account storage, stays the same, and that's how we verify. So, 
For example, here in the status code, you can see that in the beginning, um, there is a value, there might be a value which the initial value and how the cell is initialized. Uh, we do not care what that value is, but we care that in the end state, we would have a success. So it's actually a rewrite. Um, here uh, hi, Andrea. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, uh, there is one question. Uh, uh, yes. It's like uh, Mohammed is asking uh, the byte code are the opcodes. So he's kind of confused about the relationship here. Uh, yeah, so actually the bytecode is the numerical representation of the opcodes. So um, I think I have the opcodes here, the bytecode here. So for example, if I take this bytecode and go on to a website and look for, I think it, Etherscan has a pretty good tool, uh, Etherscan, uh, this assembler. So basically here you would introduce the bytecode which is written by the compiler. Um, and you would decode it and have all the opcodes here. Great, awesome. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So let's look back at the proof. Okay. So we can see that the process returned a sharp top, which um, in our tool, in our prover, means that everything is okay. The proof is complete and we have the guarantee that the decimals function works as expected and works as a getter should work. Uh, and it has no suspicious WS code which would change the state. Um, yeah. So going back to the storage here, um, as I said, the account here is where we check that uh, the account storage uh, doesn't change at all. So the way it's, uh, the storage was in the initial state is the same way the storage is going to be in the final state. Um, okay. So, so far so good because everything is pretty straightforward because we only have one case. Um, there's no um, breaking points. There are no branching points. Uh, but let's look at the um, approve function, which if we look at the code again, um, sorry for all the go the going back and forth. So yeah, as I said, the approve function has uh, uh, initially two values, but it's going to call an internal function and we're actually going to look um, Actually, the internal function would do all the work. So if we're just going to look at the internal function, as I said, it has the two require clauses. And um, if the values are good and these conditions are uh, met, then the allowance for of an owner to a specific spender would be updated. Um, yeah, so if any of this would um, fail, then we would go into a revert case, basically. So, okay. That means that we have two cases, the case in which the values provided, the arguments provided work, and the case in which the function would have to revert. And we must specify both of them because we care that the contract works as uh, behaves as expected in both cases. So, um, let's look at the specification um, here. So, yeah, if we are looking at um, the success case. Um, we can see that we are calling the approve function with uh, two um, symbolic identifiers, two symbolic values. And as again, um, as before, we are looking at the entire execution of the program because we have no interest in look, starting the function at midway. Um, this time the function um, instead of returning a value uh, only returns true or false if the function works behaves correctly or reverts uh, so in this case 
since it's the success case, we are also expecting that in each execution, the status code would be a success case. And, um, okay. Uh, so in the contract storage, this time, um, we have a re rewrite, meaning that the account st storage should be the same as initially. The only difference and the only update would be that um, for the allowance key, which is the position in the storage or the index of the allowance of the owner to the spender, um, in that case, the amount is updated. So again, this is the successful case. So yeah, as requirements, you can see that we expect the owner and the spender to be in the range of an address. We're expecting to amount to be an integer, an EVM word, um, from which takes values, as I said, from zero to two to the power of 256. And uh, we're also ex expecting that both the owner and the spender are different than zero. So here is what, uh, here is what, where we are doing the check. Um, okay, so, with this proof, uh, with this on, with only this specification, we would look um, at. If I go back to the um, symbolic execution diagram, we would only look at a single part of this uh, space because since we haven't tested the case in which the uh, function fails, we are not looking at all the corner cases and all the space of the values. So that is why it's important to take all the corner cases in consideration. Um, okay. So the revert case is um, pretty similar, uh, but with a few key differences. We're also calling up the proof function with the symbolic values. Um, this time we don't care about the output, so this is what this underscore means here. Um, but at the status code, it says that we're always expecting a revert. Uh, the storage shouldn't change. And um, as a requirement, um, either the owner or the spender, one of them should be equal to zero. Um, yeah, and this should result should um, result in an EVMC revert always. Um, yeah, so basically this is how uh, this is our approach to formal verification. Um, yeah, also what I wanted to say is that, uh, for example, if you uh, choose to or you don't take into consideration all the cases. And for example, you forget to put these uh, constraints. So for example, if you delete it or comment it, then the prover would um, throw out some error messages and throw out the configuration of the, uh, a, a configuration of the state in which the prover stopped. So uh, I also did that um, before, and this is the configuration for the case in which we are doing um, the success case, but without the requirement that owner and the spender should be different than zero. Uh, so in the case in which they are commented, for example. Okay, so in that case, um, I'm just, I know it's pretty big and pretty ugly, so I'm just gonna go through some key cells and explain them. So the case cell, which always shows the execution or the instruction at which the machine is, uh, it's at hold. So since it's the same as um, in the specification, it means that uh, the function uh, executed completely and we are at the final state of the machine. Um, okay, so in the output cell, um, without the padding of the bytes, we can see that we have the message that uh, the proof was from the zero address and uh, we have a revert case in the status code. So the function reverted. Um, okay. If we also look at bottom, 
uh, at the requirement clauses or where requ requirement clauses should be, uh, we can see that um, the owner at line 100, we can say that the owner equals zero. So basically it showed us the case in which, or a counter example in which the program failed, where the proof failed. So basically from this point, if I was writing this, uh, writing this uh, specification, um, I would look at the solidity code, uh, look why the uh, program fails when the owner is zero. I would see the requirement clauses and then I would uh, update my specification to add the clause, which I just uncommented or I just commented. So yeah, basically this is how we do verification. Um, okay. So, yeah, that's, uh, most of the presentation. Um, uh, I would also like to tell you that we have a tutorial for the K framework, uh, which takes you from zero from installing it. And it goes to, uh, all the way to proofs, which I talked about and presented you now. So if you want to learn K and it's appealing to you and you want to try it, uh, you can try this uh, tutorial. Um, okay. We also have, um, we are hiring. We are looking for a full stack developer and a technical writer to help us with the blog posts. Uh, the full stack developer um, should have knowings of Python and ReactJS. But if you want to try, send us your resume and we're gonna respond. And yeah, uh, we have a Discord channel and a newsletter. Uh, if you have any kinds of questions about the K framework or the KVM, um, then drop a question there. Uh, we will answer pretty shortly. So yeah, any questions or? Uh, I guess not uh, not any question from the viewer side, but yes, uh, would be great if you can sh share those links. Uh, I don't, yeah, it has already been mentioned in the in your slides as well. I can see, uh, but would be great uh, if we can share those live, right? To uh, to learn uh, K frameworks and all. Um, okay, uh, should I share them in the chat here or yes? You can just share in the private chat and we can just forward it. Okay, sure. I will do that. Uh, let me turn off the share screen. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, I'm going to send all the links now. Mm hmm. Got it. Let me just quickly forward down. Right. Yes. Sure. Yeah, as you know, saying great talk, and he's actually thanking you for the presentation. So yeah, I can say, uh, like, what do you think, uh, Andre? Uh, what is the world around formal verification? Like, is it uh, uh, like that much wide uh, regarding a uh, normal auditing that we have? Or what do you think, uh, like, it's, it's still being unexplored and uh, we have a lot to do in formal verification or still not being followed at a, uh, you can say, a wider scale? Yeah, so um, it's not so widely adopted now. So there's mm -hmm. a pretty 
a huge opportunity for everyone to join in. Um, but yeah. Okay, so what is uh, our approach that you would recommend uh, for a person looking forward to learn or get into formal ver verification? So I guess KVM is uh, one thing that uh, one should be looking forward. Like what, what, what uh, would you recommend? Okay, so KVM is our approach, but it's not the only formal verification tool out there. I know there mm -hmm. are, uh, from top of my head, there are very fast and other. There's also um, an HEVM, an implementation of EVM in Haskell. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but in this time where everything uh, or most of the information is on the internet, I'd say that um, it would be interesting to start learning and looking at a bunch of papers. Like, mm -hmm. I know there are uh, some papers out there online. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'd say, yeah, that's one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, please uh, let me know those papers so that I can just attach it with your slides. And uh, I will just forward it down into the channel. And yes, I'm just waiting uh, for some questions that we have from the viewers. Because yes, we know formal verification is still a very new space for everyone to jump into. But yes, I hope if we get more questions, uh, else we are good to go. Uh, let's just give five more minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I guess we are not having uh, any other question. So I guess with that note, uh, we can actually end uh, the day one. So it was amazing. And ending it with formal verification just added a charm to it. So yeah, thanks, Andre, for coming up and joining Unchained. So like again, we can just say thanks to you for being a part. Uh, completely yep. our honor. And yeah looking uh, looking for more such events and more such collaborations with you and yeah with that i will just want to say uh, best of luck for all the runtime verification team and just keep rocking yeah thank you for inviting me so yeah have a nice day thank you andre have a nice day bye bye see ya